Star Drive 117.8 You soaring up with sky, now's the time, don't delay I'm sitting in my ride and it's time to fly So let's realign, just listen and fill your mind Hey guys, how is it going? And welcome to the Morning Star Drive on 117.8. It is Wednesday, February 14th, and so happy for you joining us. We are ready to start another day together with the Lord. So subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on SoundCloud, and make sure to support us on Patreon. So today we have an exciting podcast for you. We have Health is Happiness, the Bible History Word Study, and of course commentaries, updates, and news on what is happening around the world in this history today. All right, everyone, how are you doing? Yes, it is Wednesday, the middle of the week. Hope you guys have enjoyed your week thus far. Don't forget, tomorrow we have Q&A Thursday, so get those questions ready and send them to me whenever you can. And if you haven't yet, leave a like and comment to build our community. Just super happy for everyone joining us every weekday on the Morning Star Drive, so let's get up and support each other each and every day. This week's Sunday message titled, Good Words Cannot Be Given in One Sentence. It Takes Time. Amen. All right. So it is Wednesday, everyone. Already the middle of the week, the 14th, which means we're smack in the middle of uh, February right now. Because remember, February is a, it's a leap year. So it goes to February 29th. So the 14th is basically the middle of the month. And of course, today is Valentine's Day. And yes, yesterday I did say they don't really feel much about this day. And then I thought to myself, it's like, well, you know, it's Valentine's Day. Maybe I could use this for content for my podcast. And I was like, maybe I could do a day, like, uh, talk about the history of Valentine's Day. And then I thought to myself, well, this is kind of dumb. Like, I'm giving more credit to this day that I don't really care about, right? So I was just like going, should I even do this? And then I was like, well, I might as well, what if I make a new day and call it Singles Day? Because half the world is not single anyways. And then all the single people can enjoy something that couples cannot, which is uh, freedom. Free- they can enjoy freedom, right? And not being tied to a chain and ball. But then I thought that I would be disenfranchising people who are married and blessed, which is such a great thing in this history too. So then uh, I basically then decide to do nothing. <laughs> I am going to do nothing about this day. Uh, I don't know what it is, guys. Sometimes when I'm thinking about content for uh, this podcast, I go through these things like, should I do this? Maybe I should do this. No, then I'll do, oh, I'll do something completely different. But this is what my mind kind of goes through when I'm trying to think about the content uh, for what I'm going to do for these uh, podcasts like each and every day. Uh, for me, this is my second day of rest, which I'm happy. I think I'm fully rest right now, to be honest. I'm, I'm pretty much fully rested uh, Valentine's Day, I think I have three days in a row where I'm just kind of be fully rested. So I'm, I'm kind of happy about that too. Uh, tomorrow, I'm just going to enjoy uh, service tomorrow. Uh, probably going to just go to a cafe as usual and do the things that I normally do. But yeah, that's kind of what I think I'm going to do too. But uh, yeah. Oh, cool thing. Remember yesterday I told you guys that um, I wanted to do like everyday life testimonies so uh someone actually sent me an everyday life testimony super happy about this uh so uh guys this is karen over there in vancouver and this is her uh kind of her everyday revelation that god gives to her so please welcome karen all the way over from vancouver okay so this is just a quick um audio about kind of some realizations i get in my everyday life as pastor sky suggested on the monday's podcast um ignore the background (laughs) um yeah some things as of yesterday i was playing sports and i was asking god god please let our team win i didn't come out here god just to like tie zero zero or lose and i was like hey god if we do lose does that mean like i'm gonna doubt no and i had this whole conversation with god in my head as i was playing the game and in the end we lost to nothing and i was like well god i even prayed how come we lost and then I was going back and forth, I was like, oh, okay, it's human responsibility, maybe we didn't get back on defense properly, they got a fluky goal, like, just all these different things, and I was like, okay, God, and I just had a cold conversation, and just trying to pray through it, and I know that even if we pray, we don't always win a game, and then I was playing a soccer game, uh, hours later, and I asked God the same thing, I was like, God, please let my team win, um, <clears throat> And we end up losing 2-1. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Well, so this is just my everyday conversation with God. Even when I play sports, I'm asking God to let us win. But it's not always like actually let us win. It's more like let's not anyone get injured. Let us have fun playing. It's not really a competitive 
well, it's a competitive game, but it's not really for any medal or any tournament winnings or anything. There's no money involved, so it was just a fun, friendly, competitive game that we ended up losing. But I was like, well, God, even if I prayed, does that mean, like, the Destiny's going to change this game? Or what do I need to do to change this Destiny of the game? And, of course, I wasn't playing 100% because I wasn't feeling too well. And so, I don't know. This is just my kind of everyday life playing sports with God when I ask God for win, but doesn't necessarily mean, like, I care for the win. It's more, like, I would like to God be on our side, if possible, but I do know there's human responsibility, and we need to put effort in to actually win the game. It's not, like, just only rely on God, but we actually need to play better defense. We actually need to pass the ball. We actually need to check our marks sort of thing in soccer. So, yeah, just kind of throwing that out there. If this is how I communicate with God in my everyday life. Um, knowing, just trying to bring him into my everyday life of sports and work. And there it is. Yeah, so what wonderful testimony, uh, everyday life revelations or experiences with God. And I think it's something that uh, we all need to kind of get used to, uh, to be able to kind of have these realizations constantly all the time. And kind of like what Karen was doing is the most important part is not going to be whether she won or not. The most important part is going to be the conversation. The most important part is taking God together with you just by having the conversations, even if you win or lose, right? And I think, you know, obviously when it comes to sports and all these other different things, um, you know, I think the most important part is, yeah, so, and in some cases God wants us to win, but then our skill level is not quite up to there or we haven't tried our best. But ultimately, uh, we're learning as we are doing things together with God. So guys, if you have any of those everyday realizations, I would love to hear your realizations too. Okay, uh, this week, you know, I, I've had an interesting poll. So the poll, uh, a lot of you guys are are uh, trying out the polls. I, I think it's very, very interesting because it's about pre-dawn for 2024. And a uh, big thing here is we have about almost 60 people that have, well, at this moment right now, about 60 people have been, uh, uh, have actually voted. And number one is 36% of one to three times a week is 36%. And then second is four to six times a week, which is 22%, which is which is very good too. That's that means that what? 58% of people are going, you know, are going to pre on uh you know a couple times a week. 40, 40, uh, 58%, which is really, really good. Every day is 12. So if you put those three together, that's 50, 60, uh, 68, 60, 60, no, the 70%, 70% of people are attending pre-dawn, right? So I think that's, that's really good. It's a good sign, right? Every once in a while, that's 17% and not yet is 12%. So I would say that's about what? That's like 29% right there of the people that are doing it, uh, that are kind of, you know, just struggling with it, but they're, they're trying their best to, trying their best or getting themselves back into it. But it's a good sign that you have 70% that are attending, um, it looks like the average here is going to be anywhere from three to five times a week is going to, no, maybe no, two to four times, two to two to five around there, two to four and a half times is going to be the average. 70% of people are going about anywhere from two to four times per week, right? So I think it's good. It's a good sign. Yes, it's not the place where we actually want it to be, obviously. We want it, you know, we're always thinking in ideals, but, uh, you know, I, I think... Uh, it's a good sign that 70% of people are going to uh, pre dawn in, in the morning, right? And that they're waking up for it and they're doing it maybe not every day, but they're doing it like two to four times a week, which I think is a good sign. Now, for all of us here, it, 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 one of the reasons why I put this poll in, because we all know that pre dawn is such a huge part of Providence culture right? It's something that is so important that we consider it basic faith, like at the basic level. But at the same time, we also know that this basic faith of doing pre-dawn and talking to God in the, in, in the pre-dawn time is not a natural action that people normally take in their lives, right? Most people don't wake up that early for that reason. And even if they did, it wouldn't be because of prayer. It's usually because of, of work or school, which I think is something that we should all consider carefully about too. Like, let's think about our personal faith. And I talked a little bit about this uh, yesterday or the day before about personal faith. And even for me, the difference between me being a head leader and doing my personal faith, which is also has added pressure and expectations. And... Now that we're thinking, no, if we could get ourselves to think in that personal life, my personal faith, 
thinking about why we should do pre-dawn. And, you know, I, I think it's something, you know, it's obviously something between you and God in the end. It's just between you and God. And I think this is something that is really interesting because this would then depend on your true personal faith. Like what, what your relationship is really like with God. Like if, imagine you take yourself completely out of the church setting. Would you continue? Would it be something that you'd want to do? Would it be something that you'd do even better, right? And I think that's something that we would have to really look and say, oh, that's a very, very interesting thing, right? So I think there's some questions we need, do need to ask ourselves when it comes to pre dawn, right? So when it comes to pre dawn, the questions you might want to ask yourself is, um, do I really have a relationship with God? And I'm sure everyone who's listening right now does have a relationship. And then the next question would be is at what level? Like, are we at the level of just believing and we're just satisfied with that belief, just being in providence? Or do we believe and have that, that thirsting to get to know God more? Do we have that belief with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, just wanting to get closer to God? Uh, or maybe some people, it could even be like, do we even think that God is actually listening to us when we pray? So I, I think it's good that we kind of reflect on our personal life of faith a life of faith that happens without going to church. Imagine if there's no one there, right? The church was empty and you're the only person there. Uh, what are the questions we need to ask ourselves when it comes to our personal individual faith, right? Because I, I think it can even boil down to what if people don't really have that, that feeling for heaven and hell? Do we understand the extent to which, you know, to which we will live in such? Like it, it's, I think it's a really interesting mental exercise because um, of everything that's happened over the last four years from the pandemic to 2023, yeah, it's been a struggle for, uh, uh, the majority have struggled, and there's a, a, also another group of people that have actually thrived in this situation that are more introverted, right? Because, you know, when I think about our faith, and, you know, when I say to you, oh, what would life be like without church, without having any pressure or any expectations? But what I do believe, and I think this is something that we have to think about too, is, um, our life of faith is like uh, is just the same as a human being that's growing up, and I do believe that in the beginning of our faith we do need a lot of help. Like we do need some pressure, we do need expectation, we do need people around helping us, and I think it's just normal. Just like human beings, when you're growing up as a child, you need a parent to help you. You need a parent to tell you between like what is good and what is bad. You need. Uh, uh, you need that person that takes care of you, that motivates you, right? That even scares you at some times. And then as you, be, you grow up to be a teenager, you start to become somewhat independent, right? And you want to become someone that uh, really, you know, that wants your freedom and you want to do things on your own. And then, of course, as you grow into a full adult, the responsibility is fully yours, your, you, yours and yours alone, and you deal with your actions and all the repercussions of your actions too. And I think it's quite interesting to think about in terms of personal faith too in this way. Because even when you become adult, there's stages of adulthood too. There's the beginning of adulthood when you're learning responsibility on your own. And you're trying your best. You're seeing if this works. You're seeing if that works. Is this the best thing that I should be doing? And then you learn through experiences in life that tells you like, oh, that was not a good thing that I did. I'm never going to do that again. You know what I mean? Like we all learn it as we grow. But also as you gain your independence, most people get married. And when you get married, then you have this interdependence where Two people, are, uh, two people become one and they rely on each other. They help each other. They're the ones that can, you know, give people the upper edge on the things that they're not very good at also, right? So when I was thinking about this, I was like going, yeah, that's a very interesting, uh, it's, it's very interesting. Our life of faith too is very similar where in the beginning we have a lot of help, a lot of people helping us out. But you reach a point when you're, uh, you reach like this maturity in your faith and you really have to do start doing things just like how you do things in the world. Like I know people who are business people in Providence and they are motivated. They are responsible. They do everything that they can. And when they do it, what happens in the end? What happens in the end is they make this great business, right? It's their personal responsibility. It's the things that they want to do. They understand how important it is. And I think also when it comes to us in adulthood of our spiritual life, we have to start realizing these things too, 
right? Like, uh, and here's something cool. Like, on a side note, because we did probably the media yesterday. On a side note, like, just having this conversation right now about pre dawn and how, you know, just look at our stats. The number one group of people that are doing pre dawn is one to three times a week, right? My side note here is when, it ju- when you just look at the, the cause, like, the reason why Sunstein was sentenced, and the big issue was. Did people have the inability to resist? Do they have free will? The answer is, are any of us brainwashed? When the majority, 40% of the people are going to one to three times, even though Sunseem tells us how important pre dawn is, one to, one to three times is the number one thing, right? It just proves that we're not brainwashed. Like we're not stuck in this like cult zone type of thing. It just, you know, just this poll itself um, shows you that we're not forced into this. And kind of like uh, the article was saying, we do as we please or what fits our mood. That's not brainwashed, right? So just that's, that's just a side note that I was, I was thinking about right now because I was like, oh, yeah, that's so true. Like we, if we are really brainwashed, the major, like you'll have like 90 something percent or maybe 80 percent doing like seven times a week, like six times a week, whatever it is, every single day kind of thing, right? So it is something that I looked at. I was like, oh, that's it, it's so interesting. Like on a side note, this is the reality of what uh, Providence is, is it is truly voluntary. It's something that you choose to do. And even those who want to do it still can't do it, right? So, you know, when I think about pre dawn it's like this relationship with God, like the communication we have with him at the pre dawn time, it is so voluntary. It is about how much we realize. It's about how responsible we are, right? Because even when I think about when people are married, they're not going to always be in good terms. Sometimes they're going to fight, but they have to, they have to stay in the same house, even though they're fighting, even though they're upset and angry at each other and stuff like that too, Right? And kind it's kind of the same thing as like even even though like husband and wife could be in a fight, they still have to hash it out. That's part of the relationship. And I think that's something that we realize when it comes to our true relationship with God is, yeah, there's gonna be times you don't want to, but you know that this is part of the relationship, right? We choose to do pre dawn because we know its importance. We choose to do it because we know that it draws us closer to Him. We choose to do it because it helps us to be more in love with God too. And, you know, it it basically comes down to uh, our realization, our responsibility, and how much we truly want to try to know Him better. Like, I think we need to have, like, I think we, we need to have conversations about this, right? Because I... When it comes to pre dawn, how many people actually have conversations about it? It's usually just education. This is why you should do pre dawn, right? It's just it's basically just education. It's basically just we know. Some seems said so, so we gotta do it kind of thing, right? But I do think that we need those these types of conversations uh, and helping each other to do it in different ways. Like uh, for those of us who've been Providence for more than five years, I think. We definitely know the importance of pre dawn and why we should do it. And we need to discuss like the issues we face of even though we know the importance, why don't we do it? You know what I mean? And I think there's going to be many different reasons out there, right? But even though we have all these reasons out there for us not to do it, what would make us go and do it still? What would make us really want to do it? And I think that would be a more honest conversation that we can have with each other, you know? Because I know some people are struggling in faith, right? So that's why they don't do it because they're struggling in faith. Some people are burned out. Some people are just physically unable because of their health or because they have a poor lifestyle. Like there are so many things that we do not know about each other, but the general public, which, which I would say would be anywhere from like, 50 to 65%, somewhere in that range should be able to do it. And of course, we're going to have our ups and downs here and there. But I think that uh, for a very, very healthy church, you're going to have like 50 to 65% at least. Oh, somewhere in that range, 50, 65%, around there. That should be coming to pre dawn and stuff. And, I, and, and even if they come to pre dawn, I wouldn't say perfectly, but yeah, uh, anywhere from like three to six times a week, I think that, that would be something where we'd be like, oh yeah, that's pretty healthy. 
right? Because there's just so many things that go on. Like even Chinese New Year right now, so many people are off to, uh, you know, their hometowns. And uh, even in Malaysia right now, churches are closed. They're actually closed, right? So we have to think to ourselves is how how can we get ourselves back up to that point where we were before or we can do better than we do now? And I think that's a great conversation. Like, you know, like I said, I don't think it's healthy to just say, why aren't people coming to Pridon? Don't they know how important it is? And the answer is absolutely. And if I were to take a, uh, like talk about this one step more deeply, people not going to Pridon is, is not like the issue itself. It's just a symptom of a bigger problem that we may not be seeing. And maybe that is something that people should be addressing first is what symptom is this? Because this is what happens when we have conversations. We have those deep conversations of, hey, what about this? What about that? What's going on here? What is causing people to think or act in a certain way? What is causing people not to not want to go to pre dawn right? Is it because of they're fighting with someone? They have problems at home. They have problems at work, right? Problems with leaders or whatever it is. But I find it very interesting to think about. And in the end, uh, the problem could actually be, you know, like in the end, the problem may not even be anyone else, but it could just be our own thoughts, our own perceptions, and not what we think the problem is either, right? So I, I just think that there is so much to think about. Like the one thing I remember Sunseep said in the past is, Sunseep said that people say that uh, silence is golden, right? We've heard that before, silence is golden. And I remember that only because they use that as a, a campaign for movie theaters where they're like, silence is golden, meaning shut up during the movie. Like that's what they were doing, right? But it's true. We, we all say that silence is golden. However, what Sunseep said is, if silence is golden, then conversation is diamond. Like, that's how big conversation is. It is far better to converse rather than holding it in and just letting it brew inside. And I really, really believe that Providence has reached a point, spiritual maturity, not just mentally, as we, we grow in this history, we've always been, you know, and as, think about our channel in Morning Star Drive, right? We have always been discussing mature topics on this channel Things that would not be said inside churches or, you know, some people would say to me, I wouldn't dare to say this in church kind of thing, right? But I would say that things have changed. You know, as Sunseem says, you know, now after the rapture, we are also spiritually mature. So there are many things that have changed. Let me give an example of how things have changed, how much we've matured. Sunseem said that in the past, Someone committing the fall in a church could spiritually hurt the church and evangelism wouldn't work. But after the rapture, Sunseem said, oh, it doesn't affect the whole church anymore. So you see that when we've grown up, when we've become people who are more mature, what happens next is we become more responsible and we're not affected by other things around us, right? There's like so many things that I heard. I was like, What? And some people would be like, oh, no, it, it, it doesn't make a difference anymore. And you're like, wow, so this is how much we've matured, even though we don't feel like it maybe as an individual, but as a whole and as a group, we have changed that much better. So that is something that I looked at and said, yeah, you know, we have matured. And I think, I think it's good to have hard conversations. I, I think it's good to have difficult conversations. And I think it's good to do it in a way so that we will really begin to understand each other at a much different and higher level. And we're not here to fix each other. We're here to understand, right? We're here to help. We're here to support each other too. So that, you know, we all understand is, hey, guess what? This life that we're living is not a, a sprint. It is a marathon. It is something that we're going to deal with constantly all the time. And we have to be those that are absolutely ready to help each other, knowing that we all have that same heart to do well in this history. But sometimes it just isn't, you know, sometimes we're just not in the right situation. And it's great at those times, especially in the Sunday message Proverbs. It's like, hey, at this time, you got to join forces. When you join forces, we're really, really able to help each other. And like I said, uh, on Monday, this is a prime example of using this platform. And during the, the spiritual Oppenheimer from last year, we are really be able to help each other through this podcast, right? So I hope it's something that all of us will really be able to understand uh, at a much different level also. Okay, so yeah, that, that's one of the things I was really, really thinking about. Uh, and I hope it's something that kind of piques your mind and it stimulates your mind to think 
uh, about having these conversations, these mature conversations, uh, and hoping that uh, we'll really be able to get ourselves to that next level. Okay, so there it is, guys. That is uh, that's the first segment for today. Hope you guys really, really enjoyed that. Our second segment today is going to be Bible history. And you know, last week we talked about the seven days of creation, Adam and Eve. But today we'll go into the stories after Adam and Eve, which is like Cain and Abel and stuff too. So, well, I'll talk about the things Sunsteam talked about Cain and, Cain and Abel also. Okay, so uh, that means let's get into the first break of the day. So let's get into today's word study. Oh, just some news, popping news, fresh off the press. Uh, Eddie Kwan has bought his ticket to uh, Malaysia. So I will be seeing him uh, the day after the Taiwanese people leave. So I'm pretty excited about this too. I'm going to probably uh, call and see uh, how he can, uh, where he can stay and, you know, become the tour guide once again. Either way. All right. So uh, let's get into today's uh, word study. Every Wednesday, we do have some type of new series that is going on. We finished the foundational figures, the 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 uh, foundational books of Christianity, and now we're going into Bible history. Okay. So last week, we talked about the seven days of creation, also about Adam and Eve. And today, we'll go into the stories after Adam and Eve. Did I talk about Adam and Eve last week? I, th- I think I did. Right. So, well, and let's get into the story of Cain and Abel. Very, very short. It's all in, um, I believe it's in Genesis chapter 4, I believe, right? Genesis chapter 4 is when the story of uh, uh, Cain and Abel begins. Now, we all know the story. Cain was the firstborn, right? And Abel was the secondborn. Now, what do we know about, uh, like, the history of Cain and Abel and why Cain, why Abel was chosen and why Cain wasn't? Well, what we do know is, is that Cain was the firstborn, and symbolizes uh, the one that is born out of sin, right? From committing the fall, 
okay? Now, Abel was also born out of sin because he comes from the same lineage as Adam and Eve who did commit the fall. But the saving grace was that he was born after God permitted Adam and Eve to be together, okay? So remember, the fall is, is when, like, before marriage or before God permits. And after God permits is no longer the fall. It's like, it's like you just got married. It's like God's permission to. Okay, so this is why you kind of see that there's this stark difference between Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain and Abel were both, were, were both born out of sin. So that's something that we're, we're not going to deny. But there was a sliver of righteousness, of hope coming out from Abel, right? And one of the things that something talks about is this is one of the reasons why, uh, uh, one of the reasons why in the Bible you keep hearing that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. It happens from this time. And what Sunseem also said was, it was never meant to be this way. The first should be first and the last should be last, right? Because it doesn't really make sense that, let's pretend you're the first person to start working on something and you have, you know, which means if you've been working there the longest, you should be doing the best, right? You should know the most. You should have the most skill. You should be able to do things better than everyone else. But all of a sudden, you have these people who are younger that are doing better than those that are older or doing better than those that have been there longer than them, which should never be. And what Sunsteam said is the first should be first and the last should be last, right? Which means it was never meant to be in the way of first will be last and the last will be first, right? It basically means that whoever comes first is going to make themselves first before the people that come after them. And, you know, of course, what's going to happen is, let's just say that... Um, Two people have been in Providence for like uh, someone comes to Providence and someone comes five years later, right? Which basically means that the person who comes later is five years behind. It doesn't mean they're slow. It just means they're behind. They just came later. But if you were to look at the the first person who's five years ahead and you know look at their life at five years, and then the person who comes next who is also five, you know, but five years behind, but look at them in their five year mark, they should be somewhat similar or better or better. Now, why should it be or better? It's because the people in the past, the reason they're going to be better is because they're, uh, they are working off of the foundation that was built by those before them, right? It's like reinventing the wheel. You know, when the micro, you know, when the microprocessors came out, they were terrible in the beginning, but as they continue to work off them, what happens? People are always working off of the foundation of the people before them. So they, at the same point in life, they should be creating things that are even better than what was in the, than their predecessors were, right? However, the first will always be first and the last should always be last. That's the way it should have been, right? That's the way it should have been, right? The first should not be last, but it was made so through the spiritual history and the committing of the fall. Now, the most famous part of Cain and Abel's story was actually about the sacrifice. Now, Cain was someone who tended the land, so he had like crops and veggies, right? And then Abel was the one that was raising the animals, so he was the one that gave meat. What was the biggest difference? Well, when you look at, you know, when, when you look at the scriptures, there wasn't a huge difference, right? The only difference here is we see that is, okay, so Cain gave from his crops, and then it says Abel gave the best of the fattest portions of his first fruits to God. While Cain, it doesn't have any explanation of this. So what is the main issue? Right? What is it the, the issue that Cain is dealing with? And it's in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. And God says to Cain, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? And that's the key. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it, right? So, you know, there's a lot of people that talk about, oh, the issue is Cain was giving veggies, but you have to give meat, right? That's like some people in the former faith say these types of things. But what is the real issue? So some people are actually going to say that, oh, the heart is wrong, right? Because... Abel gave the fattest portions of his fruits and this, this, and this. And then, you know, if he did what was right, then Cain would have been accepted. And the answer is no. So it's not just the heart. So what Sunseem said is, you know, the main issue that needs to be dealt in this story is about Cain doing what is right. So what if Cain gave the best, the, the best portions, the first fruits of the veggies or crops? Let's say he did this. Would he have been accepted? And Sunseem said, no, he wouldn't. And you're like, what? 
I, yeah, what? I, I don't understand this. So then what is the right thing? When, when God says, if you do what is right, what is the right thing? The right thing is to sacrifice through Abel. So Cain, seeing what happened, instead of being jealous and killing his younger brother, he should have realized that there is a way to sacrifice to God. And he should have sacrificed through Abel, and then that sacrifice would have been accepted. And this is what was right. And we have to understand is, because of the fall and from this time, it is symbolic of what happens because of sin. Now, what does that mean? So let's give the best example, which is the time of Jesus. We have to get to God through Jesus, the one sent, through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. In his name, we, we, we can go to God, but we cannot go on our own. And this is no different than the theme that runs through the entire Bible. Look at Noah. You cannot be saved from the flood except through Noah. Get on the ark. You cannot escape slavery except if you follow Moses. It all happens the exact same way. It is a theme that we are seeing from the very beginning to the very end of the Bible. And this is one of the things that we have to look at is this is why the Bible is so important for us to read and understand. Because there is so much foreshadowing, the themes that are there from the very beginning, they are relevant throughout God's history, even until now. And that is why what is happening today, we do not rapture on our own. We cannot rapture without the Savior. We cannot rapture without the condition being set. And for our time period, because of our free will, we cannot rapture or we cannot be saved unless someone took the cross. And that's the reality of what happens in our time right now. And this was a foreshadowing of like what happened to the time of Cain and Abel is a foreshadowing of everything that came after that point. The reason Sassim says, read the Bible. And, and remember what Sassim tells us to read the Bible. Do you remember what he said about the first three times you read the Bible? Sassim said that the first three times you read the Bible, do not go in detail. Just skim through it. Like, just read through it. You're not going to remember everything. You're not going to remember all the things. First three times, just read straight through it. And when you read straight through it, what's going to happen? You read straight through it, and you're going to see the big themes, the big picture. Like, what we're just looking at right now is we are saved. Uh, we need to come to God through the one that has been chosen, through the righteous, right? If you look at a larger scale, you know, we do it through Christ. But on a larger scale, even look at the things right now is when you look at religiously, people cannot go to heaven without going through the one religion that God chooses. The one, you know, through the truth, through the words of the time period, through believing the one that God has sent. It all happens. So Abel is providence, and the Cains become everyone else who has to come through providence in order for them to receive that level of salvation. And th that is something that we all have to think about very carefully and very deeply. It is. And it's something that I hope that all of us, you know, understand the importance of why we read the Bible is those themes are all there. And the more and more we go into it, because the next story after uh, Adam and Eve is going to be about, you know, uh, Noah and the flood. Right And knowing the flood, also many themes that we ju I just talked about today of Cain and Abel, also about Adam and Eve, they are going to come out in uh, the Noah's lecture also. So I, I, I do think, uh, I very, very much encourage everyone, try to read the Bible at least once a year. And, you know, once a year is actually not too bad. Right? If you want to read the Bible once a year, I believe it's something along like four pages of the Bible you read per day, which is not, which is not hard. Right, which everyone can do right after pre dawn, read four pages, you're done. Right. And I think that's something that we all have to kind of get ourselves used to. Some of us have to get back on track. Some of us are already reading the Bible. And you know, like I know some people out there that are very, very good. Um, they read a lot of books. Like Daniel Baker reads tons of books, right? He always reads tons of books, right? Which means that if people are already reading books anyways, yeah, reading the Bible is not that hard. It really isn't. Right, you're gonna learn so much. You're gonna gain so much. You're gonna uh, be able to uh, like harvest more information, more realizations through the Bible. And I, and I hope it's something that all of us will really, really be able to uh, take to the next level. 
right? So, you know, this is today's uh, Bible word study on uh, Cain and Abel. I hope it's something that uh, you've gained a lot from or some things that you kind of, uh, now you understand better. And if you have any other questions, go ahead and put them in the comments below. And don't forget, guys, Q&A Thursday is tomorrow, so you can even put those questions for tomorrow's Q&A Thursday too, okay? So uh, today is Health is Happiness, and we are going to be going into a new series. And this new series, let me just do a double check here. Uh, this new series is going to be on, one second. It's going to be a three-part series, and it's going to be on uh, longevity, longevity, right? Living longer, right? So I think what's even better than just saying living longer, it basically means you're healthier, Right, So I think these next three weeks are going to be very, very good for all of us. And I hope you guys will enjoy this. But before we get into it, let's get into the second break of the day. From falling, I feel your warm embrace, breathing life into my withering spirit, pouring out your love and grace. So I think to myself, I'll repay you. Whoa. You pulled me out of darkness so many thousands of times. You gave me strength and courage Everything that I need in life Look at all the countless blessings I'll repay you Ooh, oh. Even if the world forsakes you And they misunderstand What it means to be in providence Holding God's truth in our hands He fulfilled the greatest history God's will and highest love All the wondrous miracles you've shown Only here in Providence Providence Push forward, we'll run Till the end With our solid faith We'll repay you with all our heart, will and life. The seals are broken, the treasure's now revealed You've shared his highest wisdom, valued secrets of how to live Looking back at all the memories, I'll repay you Who oh Even if the world forsakes you, and they misunderstand what a blessing it is that you're here Acting with God hand in hand We've received the greatest rapture We've gained eternal joy This is God's final history Never will it be destroyed Providence will shine our brightest light For your dreams, your work will be earth that will preach Gain all that you want To achieve Even if the world forsakes you And they don't understand We're more than proud to be here Holding God's truth in our hands We fulfill the greatest history God's will and highest love your words, your precious providence We'll cherish it till the end Providence 
We'll stand till the end Providence We'll live with our God Providence Love God with our hearts Will and life Okay, so let's get into our final segment for today. And every Wednesday, we do have Health is Happiness. We're going over some reruns here. There's just so much information on health, and I think it's very good for us to go over them again, just like the word. Sunseem says, if you forget, you will die. And a lot of times, we hear great information and... We just forget, and this is how we become sick and diseased, right? So uh, let's go in today. This is Julius Miomo. He's going to do a three-part series on living longer on longevity, right? So all the way over there from Australia, please welcome Julius Miomo with Health is Happiness. Hi, everyone. Julius here, and welcome to the Health is Happiness segment. We're back again with a new topic, and today we'll be starting part one on longevity. This is going to be all about how to stay young and live longer. It's kind of going to overlap a little bit with the previous topic on what did Sansinim say. So this is episode 23. Now part one is going to be about fasting. So this is a topic which I believe this topic, longevity, I believe, is important for everyone, even more so for us in Providence, since we know that the rapture happens through the body. So we want a long, healthy life to make our spirits as much as possible. Most of the research I did on this topic comes from the work of Dr. David Sinclair, who's a tenured professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School and an expert researcher in the field of longevity. He has his own podcast, and also did a really great episode with Dr. Andrew Huberman, who I've been following for a long time now. I highly recommend his channel if you really want to have an in-depth understanding of different health-related topics from a fairly nuanced, scientific, scientifically grounded perspective. Now, I think I have mentioned fasting before while talking about autophagy in previous episodes. But today I wanted to talk specifically about how this relates to longevity. I want to spend some time talking about what aging is and what do I mean when you hear me say longevity. Now when I'm talking about longevity, I'm not just talking about living longer, which is what I reckon most people are thinking about. When I say longevity, I also mean slowing down the aging of the cells in different organs of the body. The reason why I put it like this is because different parts of your body can age at different rates. Now, re the reason why that is important is because as human beings, particularly in developed nations, we are living much, much longer on average in comparison to our ancestors. Getting to your 50s was an achievement in the past with all the wars and diseases going on. Now today, 80 is common, very common these days, reaching the age of 80. Now the reason why this is a problem is, if your lifespan is outpacing the age of your organs, this can mean a very painful existence in your later years, despite the fact that you're living longer. For example, out of all the other organs in the body, the brain ages significantly more slowly, which makes a lot of sense. However, our bodies live much longer. The average lifespan for a lot of developed nations surpasses the age of 80 years old, which is also on a the average age for onset, di onset dementia. Because we live much longer, we really want our brain and body to age much slower and also at the same rate to accommodate the longer lifespan of our bodies. This would enable us to live a much more fuller life in our later years. So what exactly causes aging? Now there's a number of key drivers or markers, but from Dr. Sinclair's perspective, the core marker is the disruption of the epigenome. The epigenome is the information 
in the cells that tells it what to do. For those who remember the age of CDs, when the disc got scratched, the music wouldn't play properly or not at all. That's a good parable to describe it. Some of the information is getting lost when there's more scratches on the DNA. So the more the CD is getting scratched, these cells do not do what they're supposed to do. According to Dr. David Sinclair, this is the main driver of aging, and the other markers are mostly derived from that main process. Over time, the DNA in the cells are becoming damaged, thus they can't give the proper instructions to the cells which leads, which leads to aging and diseases. For example, cancers and tumor cells grow out of mutations in the DNA caused by damage. So what does fasting and autophagy got to do with any of this? Before I go into that, I want to talk about a bit about what Sansanim said. In 2014, 14th of May, Sansanim gave this Wednesday message called, You have to live like the Holy Son, then your constitution will agree and so you will live with him. As you can get in this message, he was talking a lot about constitution and he gave the following proverbs. People think and take action according to their constitutions. Because I have not eaten breakfast for many decades, now it doesn't agree with me, even if I eat a splendid table of delicacies in the morning. In fact, not eating breakfast is healthier for me. This is constitution. Eating late at night is not good for health. However, because you keep eating late at night, it has become your, constitu your constitution and so you can sleep because you feel empty if you do not eat. I'll pause there and let's talk about this for a sec. So Sansanim has been skipping breakfast and also not eating late. So in a sense, he has been intermittent fasting for a long time now. I don't know if that's still the case or if he's made modifications to his diet after coming out in 2018. From what I recall, I think he was eating two small meals and a few snacks in between, but I'm not sure exactly. Nonetheless, for long periods of time, he's doing an intermittent fast. What are the benefits that result from this in terms of longevity? Let's take a look. Well, in the 21st century, in this modern day and age, we have come to have this lifestyle of three square meals per day, with companies selling us snacks in between. However, counterintuitively, not experiencing hunger is really bad for longevity. The animals that live the longest are the ones that don't eat all the time. And it's not just a small improvement. In fact, it's 30% longer, according to the medical literature mentioned by Dr. Sinclair. There was a study done that he referenced, published by another medical researcher at the National Institute of Health. What he did was take over 10,000 mice and gave them different combinations of fat, carbohydrate, and protein. And he was trying to figure out what was the best combination of food. And then he cleverly also had another group. And this group was fed all the time and ate as much as they wanted. And the other group was only given food for an hour. And it turns out they ate roughly the same amount of calories. Because in the one hour, those mice were stuffing their faces. In the end, it turned out it didn't matter what diet he gave them. It was only the group that ate with that one hour window that lived longer and dramatically longer compared to the other group. So Dr. Sinclair came to the conclusion, and given that mice are very similar to us meta metabolically, that it's not as important what you eat, but it's when you eat during the day. Of course, as long as you're not consuming something toxic to the body, what you eat still does matter, and doing them both will give the most benefits. But we'll talk about that later. So what happens when you don't eat for a long period? Firstly, insulin drops and another molecule called IGF-1 is downregulated. When this happens, these longevity genes called sirtuins are activated. Having high levels of insulin all day 
being fed means your longevity genes are not switched on. The acetuidins would otherwise prevent your epigenome from falling apart. That loss of information, which is meant to keep your cells functioning over time, just degrades quicker. In other words, your clock is ticking faster by always being fed. You also don't allow your cells to have a period, period of rest to re-establish the epigenome. Now these longevity genes, they're all interlinked and these systems are set up to respond to sugar and insulin, mainly in particular. When cetuidins are active, it turns on all the body's defenses. This repairs damaged cells, improves insulin sensitivity, giving us more energy, and any DNA or cells that are too damaged to repair, the body chews it up and recycles it. In our modern life, where we sit around much longer, eating way too much, and not exercising, our, resp our cells respond by telling our body, hey, everything is cool, no problem, and they become relaxed and turn down these defenses. As a result, we age more rapidly. That is why intermittent fasting or variations of that work so well in terms of increasing longevity. While doing your intermittent fasting, it is also best to have it align with your circadian clock as much as possible. One can also do an extended fast as well. You can do it for one or two or three days. This prolonged cleansing period will maximize the benefits. Now, when it comes to fasting, it's really important to keep your electrolytes in check when doing the, especially when doing a prolonged fast. Otherwise, you can find yourself getting quite dizzy. This is especially true when people are drinking lot, large amounts of water, which people do while fasting to curb their hunger. Taking a pinch of sea salt water, with water a few times in the day will make the fast much more pleasant and less harder than it needs to be. Again, if you have metabolic conditions such as diabetes, especially if you're taking insulin medication, it is essential to consult your doctor before doing a fast. I still do recommend it anyways, even if you don't have any pre-existing metabolic conditions, because at the end of the day, everyone is different. Again, I'm not giving specific medical advice. I'm just sharing general information to help people have an informed opinion on the medical literature. Now, I know that it's extremely difficult to go for a very long time without eating, especially if you're doing intermittent fasting regularly. There are certain foods that will allow you to cheat a little bit. Now, eating these foods will knock you out of your fasted state just for a little while before you get back into it. So it still kind of works. You can have a coffee with a little bit of cream. You don't want any carbohydrates or sugar. Fat and fiber trigger insulin the least. You want to be a bit careful about having too much coffee because it depletes your electrolytes. You will definitely be hungry at the start, but if you're able to do the routine for 21 days, it becomes your constitution. The 16-8 intermittent fasting window is the most popular, but something like 12-10 still provides a lot of benefits. So that's it for part one on longevity. If you'd like me to elaborate on any particular points, please drop a comment below. Otherwise, we'll see you next week where we discuss part two. This part will be focused on what foods allow us to live longer. Thanks for tuning in and see you next time. And thank you so much, Julius, for another wonderful episode of Health is Happiness. Yes, it is a rerun, but very, very important. I hope you guys gained a lot from uh, the talk about fasting. Uh, that is something I'm doing right now is intermittent fasting too. And I hope it's something that uh, if it's something you guys think that is very good for you at this moment, I think it's something you should definitely do. Either way. All right. So everyone, it is Wednesday. Enjoy your service tonight. And then we'll see you guys again tomorrow on the Morning Star Drive on 117.8. The morning star drive on 17.8. You saw up with sky, now's the time, don't delay. I'm sitting in my ride and it's time to fly, so let's realign. Just listen if you